My name's Jo Lang, and I'm going to say a few words because on April the 23rd, 1979, I was with Blair when he was killed. And um, I think it's very important for us, I, we, we make assumptions about everybody knows who Blair Peach is, but, and I'm sure most of you do, but Blair was a, a special needs teacher in the school, actually very near here, just by Mile End Tube, Phoenix School. He was a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, he was a member of the, U, the N, NUT as it was then, and he was a very committed member of the Anti-Nazi Link. He and I went to Southall in West London in 1979 to be part of a very, very big anti-racist uh, protest. It was organised in part by the Anti-Nazi League and also by the community. And it's very important to recognise the work that was done by the community in Southall. Um, it was during the run-up to the election in 1979 when Thatcher was elected. And the National Front, as a, in my view, as a direct provocation, were allowed to hold an election meeting in an area that was almost entirely black and ethnic minority population. There was a tremendous response from the community in the sense that there were strikes, shops were shut, the place was on lockdown, and the community were on, out on the streets. But alongside of that, there was a massive police presence. And that police presence played, obviously, a huge role in what happened later. Blair and I went to join the demonstration because we wanted to show our support. And we stood around in the Broadway for a long time. Now we call it being kettled, but effectively we're, we were hemmed in by lines of police, pushed and shoved, and we stood there probably for three or four hours. It was raining, and in the end we thought we'd go home. We walked down the Broadway, away from the demonstration, and turned into a side street, at which point the SPG, the Special Patrol Group, arrived leapt out of their van with their truncheons, with their shields, and charged at us. Now, I took one look and thought, better get out of here quick, and ran down the street. When I got to the bottom of the street, I realised Blair wasn't with us. So I went back to look for him, and with the help of some very generous people, who I now know are the Atwell family, found him in their living room. And they said, it's OK, don't worry. We've called an ambulance, he'll be fine. Now, of course they'd say that, but by 12 o'clock that night, he was dead. Now, the most important, one of the major issues for me is that the police were at the hospital when we arrived. I believe that they know what they'd done almost immediately, and they were there to keep a lid on it. So during the night, Commander Cass, who then launched a, a so-called inquiry into what had happened, was in the house where we were waiting for news and <coughs> talking about what had happened. The important thing to remember is, although there was a, two inquests, a so-called investigation, I believe the police killed Blair Peach. I know they know who killed Blair Peach, but not one single police officer has ever been disciplined, sacked, put in prison for what they did. And it's a major still injustice, in my view. Now, we ha are fortunate in having four people here who are very much involved in continuing the anti-racist struggle and being at the forefront. So I'd like to ask Umesh Desai to speak first. Our speakers are going to speak for about seven minutes, and then we'll open it after everyone's spoken. We'll open it up to the floor. Thank you. Friends, brothers, uh, sisters, I'm, I'm really pleased that um, we got this session on, on Blair Peach and his legacy and fighting fascism then and now because we got to keep the memory of Blair alive. This is the 40th anniversary, of course, of his death. Uh, I too was in South Hall that day. And I should say that um, I'm the local assembly member for City in East London at City Hall. And one of the proudest things that I've done, one of the things that I've done over my three years at City Hall, which I'm most proud, is that I seconded the motion along with Onkar Sahota, 
who's assembly member for city uh, for, uh, for 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 illegal South Hall, calling for a public inquiry into the killing of black <laughs> and, and, uh, and the full the release of the full unredacted cast report. Because as uh, uh, as has been said, we know who the officers were. There was a conspiracy of silence amongst them. They, they perverted the course of justice. Uh, I mean, the things that I saw in South Hall on the 20th of April, I was on the other side to where you were, Jiri, yeah. uh, the park side. And it was a, a demonstration of lo mainly local people. Forget all this stuff about, you know, outside agitators and all that, you know, the same things we have told today as well. 98% uh, of, of the demonstrators were local people who were outraged that a fascist gathering was being allowed in the, uh, um, in the middle of, of their community. Uh, trade unions were on strike, people came out. It was a, quite a friendly atmosphere to start off with. Uh, and then it was mid-evening, and I would say a deliberate decision was taken, uh, because a few days earlier, and the link has not been made, but Paul will remember this, the National Front march in Leicester yes. was actually, uh, you know, uh, was actually more or less stopped. Um, and um, uh, again, Leicester was a huge national demonstration, um, you know, anti-Nazi coaches from all over the country, the local community, uh, and uh, the police had lost controls, or so they thought. Uh, and there was a right that day. John McDonald is right to say it was right by the uh, it was a right by the police. Uh, they had lost complete discipline. Uh, the side where I was, all of a sudden, uh, the police called and parted, and the horses came charging towards us. This was the, around the time of the start of the meeting. Yeah, there was some pushing and shoving. People were you know, wanting to go into the meeting. It's meant to be an election public meeting. And the law actually very clearly says that it should be open uh, to members of the public. But a police decision was made that, that, that only National Front um, members were busting from outside, about 60, 70 of them. Three, four, five thousand local people, more possibly. Um, Three thousand police officers. Um, and uh, the horses, as I said, just kept charging. Uh, people, I saw people being crunch, you know, bitter with crunchings, and I'll tell you what else uh, uh, happened that day, and something that, uh, that we haven't talked about that much. There could have been a second fatality that day. Um, Misty, um, and the lead singer of Misty. Clarence Baker. Clarence Baker. Yeah, Clarence Baker. So there was a house, Park Grove, I think, um, opposite the park, uh, which was being used as a, a, as a temporary base. Uh, by the organizing committee. I believe there is, he'll remember all this. The South Hall Rights Center was actually more or less opposite the town hall, and we could access that. Uh, and um, I was going to go into that building, you know, just out of sense of safety, because you saw people all around you being, you know, being uh, beaten up. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't, because the, the, there was a police raid into the house, and people were being dragged out. And as they were being dragged out, there were officers on both sides. Uh, or, or, or of the entrance to the, to the house, uh, uh, hitting people left, right, and center with their punches. Uh, and Karen Baker, as I say, uh, had a serious head injury, a blood clot. He was in a coma for a few days uh, and could nearly have died. Uh, and I just sat, stood there helpless. Uh, and it was only, as I say, um, in the early hours of the morning. I mean, there were no night tubes in those days. So I uh, stayed over at a friend's place in central London that we found out what had happened, that Brad had been killed. Um, and uh, I still remember his funeral. Uh, his past started off about, uh, just down the road. Uh, and um, uh, the call that Tony Cliff made, don't mourn, organize. And that's what we'll talk about today. But so the theme of the session is um, the legacy of Brad Page fighting fascism then and now. Now, this part. The climate then is somewhere similar to the climate today. Um, we have stories about the Malawi Asians being put up in all these five-star hotels by the popular press. Uh, Thatcher with the famous swamping speech. I know I still remember. If those of you remember Mrs. Thatcher, you know, was leaning forward. People are rather of fear, fearful of being swamped by alien culture. And uh, that partly explained the Tories uh, uh, you know, coming to power, the rise of exploiting um, uh, sort of tensions, the economic crisis, and so on. Uh, and um, we see the same thing today uh, attacks you know, on refugees, scapegoat refugees, Islamophobia. So there are similarities, but there are also differences. Uh, the difference, I think, one, the, the three differences that I've noted the international links then between the neo Nazis and the far right are not what they are today. I mean, in the late 70s, it was more the, the European fascist meeting at Dick's Mood in Belgium, uh, getting drunk, and then uh, basically ending, you know, ending uh, the, the, the evening ending, ending up in brawls between rival sort of factions. Uh, today, the international links are much more sophisticated, very well developed, very well resourced. 
uh, money. Again, the international far right today, the flow of money, particularly from America through Steve Bannon, to set up groups like the, like the movement, I think that's the difference. Um, community organizations, I've been, um, Judy talked about uh, the community in South Oak. We had powerful uh, uh, groups like the Indian Workers Association. Um, because of the way changes in society and so on, that network of community organizations is not as developed as, it, uh, as uh, today as it that was. And of course, in the late 70s, we didn't have the internet. Uh, and social media <laughs> have made a big, big difference. Um, so looking at the lessons of the past, what can we do today to build the movement? Because uh, that is what we owe to Blair. Uh, Blair's death, Blair's killing, um, something we will never forget, should be an inspiration for, for generations to come. We should, it's our duty to pass a message on to future generations of no pasara, because that's what Blair did that day. He, along with other people, went along to South Hall to be alongside a community that was under attack. So it seems to me there are five or six areas that we need to concentrate upon. Social media, as I said, uh, I think it's so important that we actually develop our own alternative to the alt-right. Uh, we are lacking, I would say. Um, and, uh, and, and, and how we actually get out our message uh, of, of anti-racism, of uh, anti-austerity, um, uh, a positive message um, that takes on, not, not just takes on the alt-right, but actually sets the agenda. Um, the trade union movement, of course, in the late 70s, we had 13, 14 million strong trade union movement. Today, the movement is down to 6 million, but that, that has got to be the bedrock um, of, 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 a, of a mass movement. Uh, and I know that um, I thought I was going to speak for five minutes, of, uh, but there we are. Um, but so the trade union movement, getting out the message through, to the right in front of the trade union movements. One of the things that we saw last year in all the mar marches organized by the Democratic Football Leds Alliance uh, was, I'm sad to say, but I've been speaking to experienced trade unionists, and I said uh, to him that uh, a lot of them were pro probably the sons and daughters of, of trade unionists. Uh, he said, forget them being sons and daughters, some of them are probably our own shop stewards out there. Um, so that education work in the trade unions is so, so important and getting the message around. Uh, certainly my union, the GMB, uh, we, had a, uh, we had speakers in the, in the main session, but also we had workshops um, about how to take the message out to our members. Uh, football and the sporting arena. Um, the fantastic call by the New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda Ardern, about a global response to, uh, to, to root a racist right wing ideology. Well, that's going to be localized. And the, 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 the hostile environment has got to be fought in all fronts. Uh, so one of the things that I've been very active upon uh, around, and uh, where I've incurred the wrath of uh, Baroness Brady is around West Ham United. So I'm, a, I'm still just about a trustee of West Ham United Foundation, which is, met the, which is the community wing of West Ham United, uh, although the club employs outnumber us uh, on the board. Um, and uh, I made a call, which I thought was a straightforward call. The DFLA are not part of and never will be part of the Western family. And uh, 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 the club refused to endorse that call. Uh, now, I've got more reasons why, um, but uh, uh, suffice to say, they've sort of softened their stance. So, Stephen Teams, my local MP, oh, but I would say stand up to racism played a great uh, role in coordinating the letter, the new own branch, uh, and all the council leaders. Um, uh, well, most of the council leaders, all the East London MPs, myself, uh, we signed this letter to uh, West Ham, and then Stephen followed up uh, the letter with a direct um, his, uh, approach to Karen Brady you know, about uh, what it was about the DFLA that was holding them back, and the club then uh, changed their stance to say they're now investigating the DFLA. Well, I don't know what there is to investigate. It's there in black and white. Uh, there are a bunch of racist, Islamophobic thugs. And I'll tell you what about the DFLA. They are the strong purpose of modern British fascism. And that is why it's important that every political institution uh, uh, you know, takes a strong stand. Uh, so that battle continues. Music, I know love music, hate racism, which I'm sure women will talk about. One can't live in the past. Sentiment doesn't get you anywhere. But rock against racism played a fantastic role uh, uh, in, in developing that mass movement in the late 70s. And I think we need to escalate our, our uh, approach. I mean, I've made a call on the mayor of London to fund an uh, annual anti-racist festival. Uh, like Ken Livingston used to do, is to fund the Rice Festival, uh, and then Boris Johnson come, come into power, scrapped it. Um, so far, Sadiq has not done that, but I've, I've been told he is sympathetic to, 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 to having an annual sort of anti-racist event. Um, so, um, and the, I'll finish on this note. 
because I exceeded my time. So as I said, in the 70s, we had a network of community institutions, Indian Workers Association, Halkavi, and so on. We got to look at how standard racism branches, other anti-racist uh, can work with local uh, you know, temples, mosques. That is, for me, is what a movement is all about. It's the ability to unite people around, a single, around an issue, no matter what differences are. That's why the approach around Brexit, whether you're for Brexit or against Brexit, Right. I mean, I've got my own views, but it's important that you do not let the racist divide us, right? And that call I thought was excellent. Uh, and in Bach and Dagnum, and I will definish on this note, the one uh, bright note on a very gloomy night for my party was uh, in London, certainly, uh, in, uh, on, uh, around the European elections, was in Bach and Dagnum, where Obara, which two year, three years ago, voted to leave Europe by a margin of 2 to 1 uh, on May the 30th, uh, the Labour Party got 40% of the vote, and the Brexit Party and the UK a lot between them got 30%. So a complete reversal and solid message of community of hope, of un of unity. A council doing some great stuff, you know, uh, 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 in the community community events and so on. We, there was a positive message. So our narrative is important. Be firm. Stand up to scapegoating of Islam of refugees. Fight back against Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. Be united. Uh, and that mass movement, we are building it. It's not that we are talking about. It is being built. It will be built to action. And that, for me, is the legacy of Blair Page 40 years on. Thank you. I'm sorry, we haven't been using the mic. Can everybody hear? I should have asked. It. Sorry? Yes, OK. Um, I'm going to ask Paul Holborough to speak. Uh, sorry, Kevin Courtney to speak next. He is um, the Joint Secretary of the NEU. <coughs> So, yeah, uh, like Joe says, I'm the Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union, which is the, uh, the fourth biggest union in this country, the biggest education union in Europe, and the result of the amalgamation of the National Union of Teachers that Blair Peach is a member of, and the Association of Teachers and Lecturers. I never knew Blair personally, but I was a, I was a student who came to London in 1977. I was at the ANL Carnival in Victoria Park in 1978. I wasn't... Uh, in Southall that day because I went home at Easter to see my parents. Uh, but Blair has been an inspiration to me throughout my entire adult political life. So the, in the weeks after Blair died, while I was still at home, I went to a demonstration, an ANL demonstration. I, my memory is shocking. It was Cardiff or Swansea where we were chanting, who killed Blair Peach, SPG. And I didn't know Blair, as I said. Since his death and since becoming a teacher, I have met many people who, for whom Blair is an absence in their lives. Yeah. Uh, Joe Lang, with him on the demonstration, my friends Bernard and Carol Regan, who weren't on the demonstration, but these people and many others for whom Blair would be part of their lives if he hadn't been killed by the police on that day. And they know him as a, a serious, a committed, a, a, te a serious committed teacher, but a trades unionist and a political activist. It is. I feel uh, weirdly humbled, and people say they're humbled when they're speaking of things, and I don't know whether they mean it. I'm, I feel really humbled that I'm now the General Secretary of the union that Blair Peach was a member of, and then that I've been asked to come and speak to this event today about Blair's contribution and about the future of fighting uh, fascism. In my job now, I go to speak to all sorts of places, and I've, in this year, I've spoken to Labour Party meetings, to Lib Dem fringe meetings, to fringe meetings at the Green Party conference, even to a meeting of the Conservative Education Association in the House of Lords quite recently. But I want to say to you that I am really pleased to be General Secretary of the union that Blair was a member of, speaking to a meeting organised by the political party that Blair was a member of, the Socialist Workers' Party. Very pleased to be here with you today speaking at this meeting. Uh, I was, uh, Vivek Chaudhry wrote an article in The Guardian that was published in, uh, in April this year, and Vivek asked me to talk to him about that, and I gave him this quote which appeared in The Guardian. Blair was an active member of the union, a committed anti-racist, and we have not forgotten him. He was at Southall with so many other teachers. There were terrible things done by the police that day, and there has never been an open and honest investigation about that, nor an apology to the Southall community. 
it's time to put that right. We want that open and honest investigation. We want an apology to the people of Southall. I think it's really good. I am really proud that my union, the NUT, started an award in Blair Peach's memory and that that award has, in amalgamations, when you join, I mean, both unions have got awards, it's, it's an open question of whether the award survived the amalgamation. I'm really pleased that the Blair Peach Award has survived the amalgamation and there is an annual uh, uh, Blair Peach Award uh, which is about commitments, uh, teach, things that teachers or members of the union do in the fight for equal opportunities for equality and the NEU has that as an annual award as well. So we are keeping Blair Peach's memory alive in that regard. But I think, not knowing Blair, but having spoken to so many people who did know Blair, that the real way that he, I'm sure he'd be pleased by an award, but I think that he would want us to be thinking about how do we continue the fight against racism and fascism and in the modern time, what do we do to continue that fight? So I am also proud that my union, the NUT, and now the NEU has a strong association uh, uh, with the Stand Up to Racism, with Unite Against Fascism, and with Love Music, Hate Homophobia, uh, Hate Racism. And I think that's really important because those organisations draw from a set of political understandings of how you fight racism and how in particular you, write you, you, you fight far-right and uh, extreme fascist organisations. Those lessons drawn from the Anti-Nazi League and from, uh, Love Me, uh, from Rock Against Racism. So I'm really proud that my union is associated with those organisations. I feel scared about the state of racism and the growth of racist organisations in this country and in much of the rest of the Western world. And there are ebbs and flows in the current state of play of the far right as part of that pattern of racism. And uh, I think we've made some steps in, in pushing them back a bit recently, and I think that's important. That doesn't mean you don't, there's not still huge space to be scared when you have establishment politicians who run the same sort of lines when you have Boris Johnson, when you've got Trump with his anti-migrant, anti-Muslim racism, anti-Mexican in his case, and those lines being repeated here, there is real reason to be scared. And many black people tell me that a feeling in the gut of their stomach that was, that was there in the 70s that abated a bit is starting to come back. And that's because the one form of racism will always grow over into other forms of racism. So the British Union of Fascists attacked the Jews. The National Front was concentrated on Afro-Caribbeans and Asians. Now we've got the DFLA and the, e well, the EDL that we defeated and the BNP that was defeated, but now there's still the DFLA concentrating on Muslims. And the, the, that concentration on Islam and Muslims is nothing to do with that religion. It is to do with, can we find a target that allows us to mobilize support for our hard right ideas and mobilizing support for any one form of racism, for Islamophobia will definitely and is creating the extra space for anti-black racism, for anti-Jewish racism. Those things grow at the same time. So it's really important that we continue this fight. I think that we have made some strong strides in hitting the hardest edges of it. It is a very good thing that Stand Up to Racism organized against Tommy Robinson in the Euro elections. My union was pleased to work with them on that. And that defeat for Tommy Robinson was a defeat for the people in this. It was, a, it was your victory in doing that. It's a very good thing that Tommy Robinson was sent down yesterday, made easier by the fact that he wasn't the European MEP. So we pushed them back in those spaces. And we have to keep drawing the lessons that Blair was drawing on in that mobilization around Southall, that when these, that you call a Nazi a Nazi, you don't call somebody who's not a Nazi a Nazi, but when you see a Nazi, you call them Nazi, you isolate them, you say these people can, must not be spoken to, we must oppose them, and then you go for mass mobilization, that we go for thousands of people on the street, and that we sometimes have to rewin the argument that the DFLA, for example, needs mass mobilization to oppose it. But we call a Nazi a Nazi, we go for mass mobilization against them, and at the same time, as well as developing the anti-fascist fight, the, the general fight against, you know, the, the casual Islamophobic conversations around middle-class dinner tables, 
We have to fight on those fronts as well. We have to fight the establishment politicians, the casual racism, as well as being ready and willing to take on the far right by mass mobilization and calling a Nazi a Nazi. Thank you very much. Right. Um, thank you very much, Kevin, for that wonderful contribution. Um, I'm going to now ask Paul Holbrook to speak. Um, he might speak for a little longer than Kevin did. <laughs> um, Paul was a founding member of the Anti-Nazi League and is a long-term, as I am, and many of you in the room are, member of the Socialist Workers' Party. And I think without the, the work of the Anti-Nazi League in the 70s, the world would be a different place. So, Paul, thank you. Do you mind if I, I don't use the mic? Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. I think the first thing to say at a meeting like this is that, um, and as Kevin and as Umnesh and Joe have indicated, that we first and foremost want to remember Blair, who was a very dear and much missed comrade. And he... I suppose joins that list of people who have paid the ultimate price for their anti-racism and their commitment to a multiracial world. We think of Kevin Gately, murdered by the police in 1974 at Red Lion Square. We think of Heather Heyer, murdered at Charlottesville last year with the unacceptable comments of Trump uh, to boot. But I think, and as other speakers have said, the most important and the most honourable way to remember Blair is to remember the organisation to which he had to pay the price of his life, the Anti-Nazi League, and to draw on that legacy but Blair would be the first person, and I must make it clear here, I didn't know Blair personally, but I was very fortunate to be the East London organiser of the International Socialist, the forerunner of the SWP, in East London, and Blair was always one of those comrades that you could never, and perhaps the SWP had a bit of a reputation, barking orders at people and expecting them to be done. It's the looks of recognition on your faces, comrades, that make me worried here. But Blair always wanted, quite rightly, the political explanation of what he was doing, why we were doing it, and of course he was a complete stalwart when it came to opposing the Nazis in Brick Lane, that marathon operation that went on for several, uh, for several years. But the best way, and I'm sure Blair would agree with this, of remembering Blair is to remember the legacy of the ANL, not to reminisce about the past. I hate doing that, but we only look at the past in order to shape the future. And it seems to me that the most important thing, which is often forgotten actually, that the ANL achieved, we pushed the Nazis back at a time where they expected to enter the mainstream of British politics. And this was a serious challenge which required serious effort on a mass, on a mass uh, scale. And it is interesting, of course, the best testament to, it's not just me or the Anti-Nazi League or anybody else saying it, the key person who said that was Martin Webster, who was the national organiser of the National Front, and he said our strategy of being respectable in suits making the electoral road, following the electoral road, was trundling along very, very successfully, and then, suddenly, everywhere the Nazis tried to organise, the anti-Nazi League was there, breaking up their meetings, picketing them, and so on, and he said our strategy was torn apart by that, and that was displayed in the 1979 election, where their vote plummeted, and they expected to get elected in the areas which they were strong. So that's the first uh, legacy of the ANL. But the, the, the other aspects of the legacy is, is that the ANL 
could only have been built as a result, as Ulrich has referred to, the great battle of Lewisham. It was out of the battle of Lewisham that it was clear that it wasn't just the socialists and the African Caribbean community in Lewisham that wanted to oppose them. There were many hundreds of thousands of people who wanted to join the, the battle against the Nazis. Just one story there. I remember being phoned by a wonderful firm of news agent suppliers who were Jewish, and they said, I utterly disagree with the SWP on practically everything except the Nazis. And I will guarantee you an unlimited supply of newsprint to print as many leaflets as you want up until the general election and uh, 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 enable them to uh, be, be defeated. And it was out of Lewisham that the SWP took the initiative to broaden the movement. And Peter Hain played a fantastic role there. Neil Kinnock, yes, keep your faces straight, comrades. He was fantastic in the anti-Nazi league. The Indian Workers Association, uh, the Labour Party and the trade unions, one brilliant example, Arthur Scargill. We had a conference in Yorkshire, and the decision of the Yorkshire Miners Conference was that the next Monday morning they would go to work with the ANL sticker on their helmet, 60,000 miners going to work. That isolated the Nazis inside, inside the pits. But you see, the other part of the, the legacy of the ANL is that it was a, 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 a united front, and every united front worth its salt has to be based on action. It's no good talking about these blood. We all talked until we're blue in the face. You have to link discussion with action. And by God, the Anti-Nazi League was extremely active. And one of the things, when I look at the comrades up and down the country in Stand Up to Racism and their magnificent, their magnificent campaign in the Northwest uh, just uh, a month ago, it, it, it is an action organization. <laughs> but you see, I think the other thing is, is that uh, I think it can be modestly but accurately said that probably the Anti-Nazi League was the most successful mass movement in Britain probably since the Second World War. And part of the legacy is, is that it shaped the attitude of a whole generation of people. So, that, you know, I, in, when I go and do meetings or places, uh, these sort of events, people come up to me. And, and Wayman is, is a good example of that. You know, you were, you, you'll tell the story you know, how you were a school kid in Little Ilford School. And, you know, the story is repeated again and again that people felt, and this was the point of the Anti-Nazi League, to give the anti-racists the confidence not to allow any racist mark to go unchallenged. That was really uh, also part of the legacy. And, of course, that legacy would be not nearly as important if we didn't take Red Saunders's commitment to all power to the imagination, which Rock Against Racism played a fantastically important role, and it was the ability of the ANL and RA to work together that really began to transform the atmosphere on our side. I never worry about the other side so much. I'm always much more concerned about the morale of our side. And if you, have, if you build the morale of, of, of your side, then you can achieve great things. And I think a testament to what we've all done in the anti-Nazi League, and I was just extremely fortunate to, to be around at the centre of it, is that we offered a template in how to fight the Nazis. That template is now taken up across Europe, in Greece with Kiefer, in uh, Germany with Aufstehen gegen uh, das Rassismus, in Spain, in parts of uh, Italy, and so on. And because, I suppose, our legacy of the ANL has been proved to be successful. You, Kevin is absolutely right, Umlesh is right, to point to the very real dangers that lie ahead of us. But the UK is unique in the sense that there are no Nazis in the mainstream of politics. And that is not an accident, comrades. It is because of the activity of the ANL. And of course, I think we have to recognize 
is that we, we, weren't, we didn't pluck the idea of the ANL out of the air. We were very fortunate in having a man called Leon Trotsky who wrote about Germany, wrote about the United Fronts, but the great tragedy, and it is a tragedy, that Trotsky had no forces on the ground in Germany to stop the human catastrophe that took place with the rise of Hitler. We in the SWP, and we need to be completely modest about it, we had sufficient support in our branches and in the trade unions to form a little cog and along with tens of thousands of others to turn the bigger cog of the trade union movement and of the uh, wider community. But without the template offered by Trotsky, then we would be much uh, less able to do that. In other words, we are, uh, are people who, who stand, if you like, on the shoulders of giants. And therefore, the question of theory is extremely important in the most practical aspects of it. And so I think that that's the legacy of the ANL and that God knows, I believe, we're going to need it in a hundred times more in the challenges to come of Farage, Johnson and so on. Thank you very much. Our last speaker in this part of the meeting will be Wayman Bennett. After Wayman has made his contribution, we'll pause and you can all talk to each other for two minutes or one minute, and then we will take contributions from, from the floor. So, Wayman, I'm sure, needs very little introduction. I'll He's going to be quick. I'm going to be quick, comrades, because Hello. I want to hear what people say. I have famous last words. I want, to, I, want to, I want to thank both Kevin and Umesh and Paul for, the, for what they've said and for their contributions and the bravery of where they've stood up. And I, I want to say something. I grew up in East London, in Stratford, East London, and I went to a school called Carpenters and uh, Rokeby. And um, it's very important to understand something in terms of the growth of the far right at that time, was that literally you couldn't go to school. Sometimes, I remember that the teachers used to say to us, Bulldog has been sold at the front of the school. The best thing for the black kids to do is to go through the back gate. And it wasn't said in a kind of aggressive way. It's, look, it's just best for you to go through the back gate. Actually, you, put your, you used to have those anoraks. You put your anorak up and you'd walk home and you wouldn't look left or right. And actually, to be honest, you were constantly terrified. There were people there who were skinheads, whatever it is, and you were constantly attacked. It's not true that it was all right. You were constantly attacked. And the reason why... And, and, and so there was a sense in which you didn't, it wasn't even unspoken. Large numbers of... By the way, the insurgency and the anger was the same as the climate change kids. That's how we felt. We felt there was this group of people constantly not allowing you to even live or breathe. And people were being attacked. There were people being... And, that, and, and then the anti-Nazi league was... It, it, it freed people in two ways. I was brought up as a Jehovah's Witness. And I, I would diligently go to my Bible studies every week. And there would be people there with, who would come in with their star, their purple star who were German, who'd come in and say, I was in a concentration camp. And that's what happened to me. And they'd describe in detail what was going on. It didn't take very long for you to make connection. I grew up in a Jewish area, a Dockers area. And you'd listen to the people give you the exact experience about what's happening. And it was a deep working class area. It wasn't automatic. Our group was mixed. It was mixed black and white kids. I remember a kid called Dirk Dursa used to say, the Nazis are in the front. Best that we go off in a different direction. Umesh will tell you, anybody that said they... They went east of Liverpool Street, yeah? I went past Liverpool Street, you'd go, you're a liar. <laughs> what are you talking about? You've never been there, yeah? Because you couldn't go there. And I think that, I mean, the reason, I, I've got to be careful because I'm going to talk, to, it's not about that. It's about, in there, there was an organisation called ILTA, in a London Teachers Association, and they produced a leaflet that said every kid was equal and everybody was big. In that leaflet, you can go and check it now, there's Blair's name. It was that not only did they go and do the demonstration, they fought in the schools and brought the idea in about why you want to change that. And actually, it's, not a, it's a transformation. What we're talking about now is that that tradition was a united front. And I think, in some senses, if you think about it, uh, Martin Webster and the rest of those people, there was only one national front. In fact, the Front National named itself after the National Front in Britain because it was the most successful fascist organisation. Today, you have Salvini, you have people like the National Rally in really high positions, but also high ideological positions. The job that we've got to do 
in some senses, is to defend that tradition. Michael Bradley said that being in Britain sometimes is a, is a bit shit. Do you mean? I mean? He's, he's delirious, he said, right? But what he meant was, in some senses, there's some traditions that are worth exporting, right? One of the traditions is that of the United Front. And actually doing it on a kind of, uh, 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 doing it on, on an international basis. What are the tasks ahead of us? The first thing is we have to have unity. And I say this is important. Look, I tell you that the, 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 the people might not, last year, this year, last year, this time, the, the, um, the football lads that came out of nowhere, by the way, I don't know, I mean, Kevin and the rest of people were brave enough to get on a demonstration, which I was instructed by the Metropolitan Police to say, if you go on that demonstration, you will not get off that demonstration. You cannot go on that demonstration. Some people thought it was an act of cowardice, but you know, <laughs> self-preservation came in. And but Kevin and Umesh went on the demonstration, actually, in that sense. It was not true that they were not an organisation. They've actually been pushed back by the work that's been done over the last couple of months. It's not true you can't break down. And Sarah and I'm starting to name people in the room, but anyway. <laughs> but the point, the point I'm trying to make about Stand Up to Racism as a national organisation is on the, we're organising an international conference um, on the 19th of October. And I think it's a very important conference in terms of bringing together the international experience about what we're trying to do. And I think that part of that is what we have to remember, what Blair brought to us, what the anti-Nazi looked at us, but there's also been a tradition of United Front that goes from UAF all the way through uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the present day. I want to also mention another quick thing, the question of culture. I mean, there's people here who work with me on, on Love Music, Hate Racism, and we've had to do two things. The... the Carnival events suddenly gave you a sense of your sheer size. And the fact that the Nazis were boring and dumb and had no culture and what was interesting and the celebration of the actual bringing together of what I call the punk reggae um, rebellion. Punks and reggae, things from Jamaica, everything was, it's all sheared. And actually began to realise you could dominate and it gave you confidence. You took off your anorak and you went with the other people and it gave you a sense of that. But that didn't come out of nowhere. I think it's very important at the heart of it was socialist politics. My teacher was in the SWP and was a drama teacher and he put on a play called The Irresistible Rise of Artu Iwi and he also ran a play in Stratford's um, Chase State. It's not true that they just... They also said, I'll defend your right to go to school, but they also politically organised on all kinds of different ways. They used that imagination in order to do. I think you have to have that ability to be flexible about what you're faced with, but also have the talent to try and drag in and bring people. The other thing that was interesting, I was 12 years old, and I remember them bringing us all into a classroom, and they went, well, what do you think we should do? And it was shocking. Because the first time a teacher turned around and said, you're in charge, whatever it is, let's work out something to do. Uh, I, I'll end up on this. The idea of the potential for change now is bigger than it's ever been. When I look at those school kids, they remind me of the people coming out of climate change. They remind me of what I was like when I was 12, because we had that sense of coming out and doing something. I think we've got the potential to match that by making sure that we, um, we build a movement that captures what took place inside the NL. But we've got bigger questions, I think. We face... I'll end up on this. I really will end up on this. Boris Johnson... I think Boris Johnson is, I know people say he's a buffoon, but I think he's incredibly dangerous, actually. Because Boris Johnson and people like Nigel Farage, Nigel Farage says that um, Enoch Powell is his, was his favourite person, but they're now becoming to, at the centre of British politics. Not only them, Sebastian Kurtz, all these right-wingers come at the centre of British politics and bringing a level of racism, Islamophobia that we have not seen for a long time. We're going to be involved in a fight that we haven't seen... Well, we're going to be involved in a serious fight... I, I just want to put the idea out that we have to have an, a mass anti-racist counter-offensive about what's taking place. I think we have to have that and we have to embrace that as a way forward. And in terms of love music, we'll have to both do it on the airways and on, on the internet. I worked with um, people here from love music. They've got some of the biggest stars, Stormzy, Dave, a whole series of different people who came together. People might not even know who those people are, but trust me, they had 32 million imprints on their, um, on their, and their way of talking to people in terms of beginning to bring wider numbers of people. I've got to shut up. I'll, anyway, I'll shut up there. If you can indicate by, uh, by putting your hand up if you wish to speak, and um, at the end of people speaking, our uh, speakers will come back and say just very short comments. So um, can I just...
comrade at the front, yes. Sorry, I'm pointing you. Yes, I'll get my assistant. Right, thank you. Well, I mean, we, we always say we're the memory of the class, and the reason being that we have to learn the lessons um, of what's gone before. And it is so important that we remember what happened in the late 70s. I was, around, I was a very young teacher in National Underline, and it was very, very scary. Um, the National Front had targeted Tameside, um, and there were times, you know, we had to run. I mean, they even had a football team in the Sunday League. You know, they were getting that much support. And we don't want to go back to those days when people were getting beaten up uh, and so on. Um, just a couple of points, really. One is the role of the police. Um, we were on Waterloo Bridge on the uh, Extinction Rebellion thing uh, at Easter. And people were very soft on the police. And I know that's going to change, but there is this attitude that the police are on our side. And what was very, very clear was the National Front couldn't have marched half as much as they did without the police defending them and supporting them, to the point that when Martin Webster wanted to march through Hyde, the march was banned, but he marched alone, and he had half the bloody Greater Manchester Police enabling him to do that, an absolute disgrace. And um, there's a photo in the exhibition of Romelia Patel, a very young Asian woman who very bravely also marched. Um, there were some fantastic people around then. Um, I mean, I, I had death threats um, about 25 years ago from the BNP. I had to go to the police because I wanted to go public. All the police were interested in was finding out who the ANL activists were in West Yorkshire, reeling names off to me, and I just said I didn't know them. Um, but they knew who were doing the death threats. They did nothing to arrest them. We cannot trust the police. They are not, you know, when it comes to it, they're not on our side. Right, sorry, just the other thing was about the United Front. It is so important we build as widely as possible. We had teachers against Nazis, school kids against Nazis, council workers against Nazis. Uh, we were selling badges by the, by the hundreds. Um, and, and, you know, as uh, Paul said, the one thing is if you're against the fascists, you're with us. Yeah, and um, we've learned that. I mean, in Dewsbury, we've had rallies every time the fascists have tried to march. We've had rallies and we've invited absolutely anybody who agrees with us on getting rid of the fascists. Um, and so that is why we have these meetings. So we, we don't want them to grow like they did in the, in the late 70s. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi, I'm Camilla from East London. Um, I think... Um, it's kind of, it's, uh, I think if you look back on um, the ANL as someone who obviously wasn't around um, back then, it can kind of seem a bit as if like everyone always loved the ANL and like, you know, it was just inevitable that it was going to grow and be so successful. I think if you, you read things like the interview with um, Paul that we've got in International Socialism Journal, it can, kind of becomes clear that there are actually debates um, the whole time, um, debates about whether you should confront the, um, the National Front um, you know, and try and stop them from marching, or should you have a march in a separate area? You know, debates about whether, you know, by being anti-Nazi, um, I think Paul Gilroy, who's a lecturer at, at King, sort of said, oh, is that a bit sort of nationalistic? Is that kind of harking back to, to the sort of nationalism of the Second World War? Is, you know, some, some argument like that, you could probably explain it. You know, debates about, you know, all kinds of, um, uh, of different, different issues. So it wasn't, you know, inevitable that it would, that it would be a success and that, that it would grow. Um, and I think... Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of testament to the fact that, you know, looking back now, everyone yeah, seems to agree that it was such a successful organisation that people like, um, like John McDonnell are now saying, oh, we need another, another anti-Nazi league today. And, you know, maybe that's something people would um, want to discuss. So, you know, do we need to try and replicate the organisation or do we need something different? Is Stand Up to Racism a more, a more suitable organisation, you know, at the moment, um, you know, given the kind of the multiple threats that we face uh, at the moment? But, um, yeah, I just want to say that, um, you know, that, Anti-Nazi League was a very broad organisation, involved everyone from people in the arts, from people in, in music, from Labour MPs, people like P Peter Hain. But I think we should be very proud of the role that the SWP played within it. Um, you know, it's a network of committed activists you know, all around the country. Um, you know, it's like, like today, if someone emails me and says, oh, they want to support climate strikes, but they don't want to come to London, they live in, in Exeter, you know, I can say, 
you know, do you know that um, Richard Bradbury lives in, in Exeter? Because, you know, because we have that network all up and down the country. But I think more importantly, we're a group that has that theory that Paul talked about and has that politics and that strategy and can remember our, our history and, and can put those, those arguments with the people around us, um, you know, at different strategic points. Thank you. Um, Hi there, yeah. Um, I, think, I think the thing to remember is, I mean, first of all, I was um, uh, less than two months on my fourth birthday when Blair Peach died. It's not funny. And, I, you know, I wish he was my, a teacher in my school, but, um, but may he long rest in peace. Um, I think the thing to remember is, is that we, as far as I'm concerned, we do have a Nazi um, um, league running the country, and that is the Conservatives. Uh, that is... The thing to remember when you have um, uh, the likes of Theresa May, who is highly responsible for the Windrush debacle, you have um, Boris Johnson, who is Donald Trump Mark II, who who I must say is a dangerous. Somebody said that he's dangerous. He's dangerous. I don't think he realizes how dangerous he actually is, and he is about to become our prime minister. Well, He's not my prime minister. If you want to call him your prime minister, fine. He's not mine. Um, I don't think he realizes how dangerous he is. I don't think um, Nigel Farage realizes how dangerous he is as well. And I think, you know, people who support the Tory party, and I'm hoping that there's nobody in this room that does, they need to wake up and they need to realize that the longer these people are in power or the longer that these people are allowed to breathe and to speak that gives them the spring that provides a springboard for for people to attack people of minorities who are disabled who are jewish etc etc so that's the thing to remember as well Yeah, hello. It's Jim Fagan from uh, Wolfham Forest. Yeah, I was in Reading uh, when the anti nazi League started, and uh, uh, one of the things I just the, the thing that I want to stress is about the creativity from below, uh, because uh, we had a launch meeting. Paul Holber was there, and we had a liberal student who was trying to take the Mickey, really, because we said we want groups in the schools, etc. And the liberal student said, well, "What about school students?" You know, and uh, actually, out of that came. Uh, a school students group, which is fantastic. Uh, but the best thing about it, because, you know, they, they produce a scan, the, 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 the magazine, and, but the best thing is all the stories you find out about the Waltham School, Walthamstow School for Girls who occupied with other students to stop the National Front meeting. But the best thing I thought ever was, I, I, I asked the Bishop, Bishopsgate Institute, you know, have you got any copies of scan? And they said, no, we haven't, but we got this. And it was two pages of type leaflets uh, stapled together by school kids in South South London, you know, you, which you think is hardcore National Front area, and that was absolutely fantastic. The other thing was, you, we were the postal address for school kids against the Nazis, and we got you know kids from Northern Ireland with no National Front. Except, fantastic creativity, uh, which you know we recreated. And I think with the best we've seen it in the Northwest actually recently. You know. You have to be creative, you have to do it from below. You can't direct the fight against fascism. Uh, now, the thing is, I want to, and it, I, I agree to a certain extent. Now, the thing is with the right, what we've got now, which is, I think, the standard racism has got to take on board is, to quite, it's actually quite shameful because of the hostile environment, that women, you know, that we are actually one of the few countries in Europe that doesn't offer free uh, uh, maternity care to undocumented women, you know? Uh, Hundred, we, we, people are shocked about the separation of children and parents, and there's 170 that happened that, to this country last year. So, I think there there are people fighting against hostile environment, which is the way we take on the Tories and the bedrock of fascism as well. Uh, but we've got to do it because I think standards of racism traditions need to be brought into the workplace because there are good people there, but they don't have our traditions, and that's I think essential that we do that. Thank you, um, comrade. The woman in green. I thank you. Um, I think that one of the things Blair would be most shocked about, or maybe he wouldn't, is actually we're having to do it all again. Uh, and that's really, you know, his legacy. Uh, we did push them back, but they're 
more virulent across the world uh, than ever before. And I think a well, question really for the panelists coming back, you know, in some ways, because Islamophobia has become the most respectable form of racism, it is much harder, I think. When the NF were there with their Union Jacks, with spikes on the top, marching like Nazis, it was easy to call them Nazis. And the really important thing we did was to call uh, Tommy Robinson a Nazi, and we had to keep on doing that. And just to say two things. Uh, I think the possibilities for people just to use love, music, hate, racism in the creative way that Rock Against Racism has been used are there and they're easy and we don't do them enough. Uh, last year we got, uh, I'm from uh, Derbyshire, uh, we got invited to the biggest uh, music festival in Derbyshire, we asked to go to the Why Not, uh, 30,000 people there, we printed 20,000 stickers took a lot of money, we raised the money, we took with the stickers, and everybody had one, two, maybe three stickers. As they came in, we stickered them. And on the second day, uh, a group of kids from Birmingham actually came up to us and said, this is brilliant what you're doing. We've just been to the Isle of Wight, and people at the Isle of Wight were chanting for Tommy Robinson. Nobody would dare do it here because of you. And that's why we have to be everywhere. The ANL was everywhere, and I don't think we quite have the reach that we need, and we need to use that label because the big names are there, as Wayman says, and we have to be really creative. We're going back again this year, printing even more stickers, getting more people involved. They're giving us 20 free volunteers to be there. It's 150 quid a ticket. They've given them to us. They understand, too, how important it is. And I, just a quick story about the importance of... Uh, the Socialist Workers' Party, because when we fight and struggle together with people in united fronts, we also have to be talking to them about the bigger question, about system change. And that's why the school kids are important. Always wear your, have, have your uh, uh, Love Music Hate Racism or your Stand Up to Racism badge on the school kids' demos, because straight away they want those as well as our stickers, we found. But uh, Wood Green, Leicester, I was on the demonstration in Leicester that Unmesh mentioned. Please write is the best, best description of it. On the way back on the coach, I'd asked Blair to join the SWP many times. And he sat and smiled on the coach and he said, OK, Jeannie. And he joined up. And this is the experience. <laughs> and I'm still at it. You might have seen me outside many meetings still holding these leaflets because we don't keep our tradition alive our tradition of the United Front, our tradition that wants to get rid of the system that creates racism, we won't be able to do it. So if you're not a member, I'll be outside again. You can say I joined up by that woman who recruited Blair Peach. And Blair Peach recruited me to the SWP. <laughs> How about that for symmetry? Um, um, what I wanted to say was, first of all, can we give a big up for Sam Kirk, who's sitting up here? She was a winner of the uh, Blair Peach Award in the NUT. And secondly, to come uh, add to what Camilla said earlier about, about it wasn't an easy time. Joe, who's uh, chairing this meeting, and Bernard Regan moved the motion at the NUT National Conference in 1979 to affiliate the union to the Anti-Nazi League and were rounded on by the then dominant political clique of the NUT, they were told uh, when, when, when people replied to them in debate that they were advocating violence on the streets, they were a bad example to students and so on and so forth. The same people had no sense of irony when they went to fringe meetings in the evening of the anti-apartheid movement and argued for the support of Nkonte with Sesue. Um, but that, that, that's, and, and locally in Ealing when I advocated it, people from the same unfortunate Communist Party background said to me, it's the people like you that lost us the Spanish Civil War. That was the level of vitriol from some people on the left at the time. So it wasn't easy. I want to just try and plug this pamphlet that I wrote with Brian Richardson, who's, who's, who's behind me, for a couple of reasons. There are three people in this pamphlet who testify to the fact that at the time Blair died, and two of them were actually Southall residents at the time, they, were, they wanted to go to the the NF meeting in Southall on that day. They wanted to be there. That was their family culture. They now are active members of the SWP who are grateful for the mobilization that the whole community made and that the ANL was part of. When Blair was killed, 
um, Friends, Friends of Blair Peach, Joe and I and others in the room, set up a Friends of Blair Peach committee to campaign for the identification of the coppers that had killed him. We had to give up because it was such a mountain to, to try and climb. Our organization was bequeathed to what is nowadays called Inquest. And Inquest is the major organization campaigning against the, the deaths of police. Now, the, if, if you go away today with just one statistic in your head, and this is on the website of Inquest today, since 1990, believe it or not, there have been 1,703 incidents of deaths in custody or following other forms of contact with the police up to March 2019. 1,703 people have died at the hands of the police in, in the UK without any comeback whatsoever. Harry Stanley, Sean Rigg, John Charles de Menezes, Ian Tomlinson, Mark Duggan are just a, a few. So I'd ask you to pick up a copy of the pamphlet and keep on keeping on. How you doing? I'll remain seated for this. Uh, Kevin White, Canning Town. I see the fear in your eyes there. <laughs> that was the epicentre of the nightmare for a lot of people that grew up in Newham. So I started off in Plasto. The National Front used to march down our street. That was in the 70s. And we all used to go to the back of the house, pull the curtains, and just basically stay there until they cleared our street. Uh, then we moved to Basildon, got worse, Canby Island, nightmare, back to Canning Town, and uh, I'm pretty much PTSD'd up all the way now. <laughs> so it's a bit of a nightmare. But essentially what it is, I hope we end up with a situation where we don't have to fight to make people activists or to create activists, because what it is, activism is fantastic, but when, it, when, you, when you're bred into that sort of field from a young age, you miss out on your childhood. You lose a lot of yourself. And you have to try and get that back when you're older. So where you should be young and carefree, you have this worry that's sitting there. And that nagging worry sort of goes on and concern into later life where you become an activist, uh, which is good and positive for the world. But I would have much rather have spent my childhood having fun and being carefree. And essentially, that's what we're trying to fight for, a world where we don't need activists because things are in the right place and kids don't have to worry about racism anymore. It's a long walk, but it's a walk well worth taking. Balwinder in the middle. And then Paul, um, after Balwinder, I'm going to ask Paul, Paul from the Northwest. I'm really sorry. I, I would... We, we are seriously running out of time. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to take two more speakers and then ask... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Are we still filming? Hello. Are we still filming? Yeah, can you stop? <laughs> I can speak more freely, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, 23rd April this year was the 40th anniversary of the death of Blair Beach. And on that uh, day in Southall, a blue plaque was unveiled. And the blue plaque says, Blair Peach, an anti-racist, killed on 23rd April 1979. It says nothing at all who killed him, why he was there, and uh, what he was doing. And it uh, says nothing about the anti-Nazi League. <clears throat> now, the blue plaque was uh, produced by a group of uh, people who are uh, what I call uh, black nationalists and sectarians. There was a group uh, set up to uh, commemorate the 40th anniversary. Myself and uh, Nick Grant and uh, Joe, we, we were playing a part in there, but they were trying to make every effort to force us out. And uh, in fact, we had to really fight hard to get, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, get, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Holbra to speak uh, on that uh, meeting. Uh, for the last 40 years, they've been trying to say that uh, some, uh, the anti Nazi League didn't really matter, but in fact, uh, uh, Blair Peach was just a, uh, someone who just walked into Southall and got killed on that day. In fact, he was a member of the anti Nazi League, like, like myself 
and uh, an active member of the SDP. And in fact, uh, we as the anti nazi played a big role on that uh, uh, day because I was the uh, one of the five member uh, co committee that was uh, set up to organize the uh, protest on that day. And also I was, one of, I was the chief steward. Also they had been trying to say at that time that the anti nazi League had no support amongst the uh, black and Asian communities. In fact, uh, I myself had uh, produced a joint statement in those days, and that was signed all the main IWAs, the main Pakistani organizations, the main uh, Gujarati organizations, and also Sikh temples. So that we had tremendous support in those, day, on those, those days for the Anti-Nazi League. But uh, I think uh, the real legacy of, the, of Blair Pitch is now the stand-up racism. I think we have all have to support stand-up racism and, and make it just as effective as with the Anti-Nazi League. Thank you. One of the things that damaged Tommy Robinson in the Northwest was the fact that we exposed he was a member of the British National Party. Strangely enough, while some people were prepared to accept that he had founded the EDL, uh, saying he was in the BNP seemed to damage him more. And I think when we talk about the NF, I think the reason for that is because it put him firmly in the tradition of British fascism. Tommy Robinson, Nick Griffin, EDL, BNP, National Front, Oswald Mosley. I think that's really important. And I want to emphasize that it was not inevitable that Tommy Robinson lost his, uh, failed to win that European seat in the Northwest. And he only needed about 8% of the vote to, to win. And there is a danger that the massive victory we had is downplayed or forgotten about. Yeah. This victory was massively significant. We should remember, Robinson built up a base of support some of his rallies were pretty well attended. Two years ago, he got 2,000 people out in Manchester on a violent demonstration. He stood in the Northwest. I believe he thought he was going to win. We launched a campaign, and we absolutely thrashed him. It was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed was within the first two weeks, I believe our campaign was re responsible for a shift. Within the first two weeks, you could see you had the minority of Robinson supporters who were dead set on voting for him, but a lot of the anti-racist majority, and this was the concern, didn't know he was standing and weren't going to vote. Actually, when we launched our campaign, we shifted that. We, uh, our campaign launched the same night as Robinson said he was going to stand, supported, as Kevin has said, by the regional trade unions and others. Our campaign distributed thousands of leaflets and posters across the whole Northwest, and the fact that he only needed 8% shifted people to realize they had to come out and vote. That's what we did. And I want to say that that united front that we built up, that was from years of work with the trade unions and others, Unite Against Fascism and Stand Up Racism. That's what we did. That's the united front strategy. That's how we beat Tommy Robinson. That's how we beat Nick Griffin. And that's how we need to face any other future far right threat. I'll quickly try and make this quick because I know we're running out of time. But um, I was basically born 20 years after the Battle of Lewisham and 20 years um, after that, when I, uh, 40 years after that, sorry, when I was 20 years old, I was one of the leading organisers in the North East for Stand Up to Racism. And behind me and the motivation and inspiration for all that was the Anti-Nazi League and in particular Blair Peach. Um, and that's what gave me that motivation. And, and, and quite frankly, every time I thought about him, I had tears in my eyes. This, this white man from New Zealand who fought on behalf of people like me who didn't have to fight this battle and paid the ultimate price um, meant that it made me feel like I have to do the same as well uh, and have to be willing to do that. So that gave me the confidence and the lack of fear in the face of the Nazis, um, even with the death threats and everything like that, to organize the way we did. And I'm glad to say in the Northeast, we've pushed back the far right 
um, to the point where they rarely organise now. And I'm, I'm sure most of you know what the situation was like up there with some of the highest prevent referrals and highest far right activity levels and all that kind of stuff. But they still have the confidence to now try to build in our working class traditions and events. Next week on Saturday, we have the Durham Miners Gala. Um, where Jeremy Corbyn will be speaking, uh, Laura Pitcock uh, and all that. We're talking about an event uh, which has about 100,000 to 200,000 people there. Uh, is Kevin speaking? Are you speaking? Yeah, <laughs> all right, Kevin's speaking. <laughs> but yeah, so we need everyone there. And the far right, last year, we had to block them and stop them getting into the gala and they tried to spin it in some propaganda campaign. And they're going to try and do that again this year with For Britain and uh, a woman called Tasha Allen, uh, Anne-Marie Waters and, and them kind of lot. They're trying to build again. So we need your support there. Not only because it stands in the tradition of everything that Blair Peach stood in as well, the trade unionism, socialism, um, and the left. But yeah, we're having, a, for the first time as well, a stand-up to racism block there, which we hope everyone will come join. So please come along to that. Thank you. Really, it's all been said. Uh, it's just a two, two or three quick points. Um, the, the motion that we got passed at the London Assembly uh, called upon the mayor to write to the Home Secretary. So it's not just about uh, the release of the unredacted cast report. It's about Clarence Baker. It's also about the police operation on the day. Let it be, because it's important we pass the lessons, uh, you know, the experience of South of that day on to future generations. 742 people arrested. The trials were all in Bardet Magistrates Court. It was only after a you know, public outcry that the cases were brought back to illegal magistrates and the, the level of the conviction rate then drops very significantly. So it's about everything of the day. Um, so the, I think uh, the thing about the anti silly, which I said earlier, it is, as Paul said, one of the great post post social movements of our time. Um, you had branches everywhere, you know, miners against the Nazis, lesbians against the Nazis, students against the Nazis. There might even be the Nazis against Nazis because of the split, <laughs> because of the splits on the far right. Um, but uh, the lesson there was a united front and bringing people together. And um, uh, I mean, just up the road, we had the first anti Nazi carnival of 100,000 people. And I think the sort of work the state of racism is doing up and down the country, but where I think we've got to link in with local community groups, that's the key. The one criticism I do have of state racism is that sometimes it takes on far too much and uh, on you know, too many issues. And I think we could maybe focus on, uh, on certain issues much more. Certainly in East London, for me, the battle around West Ham United is very, very important. My call now is to, to all London Premier Clubs. I think someone there has got a bad show racism, the red card. Uh, yeah, so I'm a member of uh, show racism, red cards, London Advisory Council. Fantastic work they're doing. So there's no need for, you know, for anyone else to duplicate that work, I think, working with them. Um, but the movement has got to be built from the bottom upwards. So one of the things around West Ham United is how we can involve supporters. Some very brave people, West Ham United Independent Supporters Association, who had lots of threats. Uh, it's, you know, it is hard, but uh, they're stuck at it. So I've joined them, even though it's not my team, just to show my solidarity. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that because that's, that's, we're running out of time. <laughs> So I think this has been a great meeting, and these meetings uh, can change, you know, gives you a sense of hope as well. And I said, I'm, I feel frightened sometimes about the state of British politics in the way the lady here described, but I still feel a massive sense of hope. And I'm just going to give you three things that make me feel hopeful. That German sea captain, that woman who is, who is fighting against and her then taking on the Italian state and winning, and a real sense of mobilization around her in Germany. We do work with show racers in the red card who go and talk in some schools where it's hard, where there's hard racist kids. But every time, and in, I think most teachers experience in every school, there are kids who say, miss, this is just racist shit. We're not having it. And they're, they're anti -ra And my third example is that traffic warden. Did you, have you seen that video? <laughs> that traffic warden who's just taken such pleasure in being able to put a fine on Toby Robinson's bus. And he's just a sign of, I mean, I don't know the guy, but He's, he's, he's mixed race, isn't he? He's a London mixed race traffic warden just taking enormous pleasure in being able to take two fingers to Tommy Robinson's organisation. And that is a good thing. There is real hope. There is a mass anti-racist sensibility in this country, won by Rot Against Racism, won by the ANL, won by Love Music, Hate Racism and, and Stand Up to Racism. It's still there. Even though things are hard, that mass anti-racist sensibility is there to be mobilised and we can mobilise it.
I think it would be quite wrong for me to be on this platform um, and not say that I think the Anti-Nazi League was incredibly important, but I want to hear publicly say how much we owe, on the one hand, Wayman for his absolutely indefatigable efforts yeah. in incomparably more difficult circumstances. Secondly, I want to also say to Kevin that it is a complete pleasure to have a trade union leader who puts his money where his mouth yeah. is. <laughs> and all that is going to be massively important. Somebody raised the point, why is, is stand up to racism the right vehicle? John McDonnell quite rightly said we want a, a new ANL. I think Stand Up to Racism is the new ANL, but we have to be very modest and we have to learn from ordinary people up and down uh, the country. But it has to be Stand Up to Racism because, as Jeannie pointed out, it is not now just the Nazis. If you, I, I find it hard to get this into my head. We are going to have a Prime Minister in three weeks' time who refers to black people as pickaninnies with watermelon smiles, people uh, wearing the hijab as being bank robbers and uh, letterboxes. This is opening the door to the British Donald Trump, and therefore stand up to racism will have its work cut out, but it's in extremely good hands of the, these two, and most importantly, you lot and many, many more outside. I'll just, I'll just be uh, quick. I'm happy about megaphone man, Paul Jenkins over there. I don't know if people remember in terms of the way that he had a go. Uh, because, and the fact that you get that level of support. I also want to say there's a bigger network around us than, than we believe. There's, I mean, I won't name right, Hey Lee, there's people that were running the um, part of the Love Music things of people I've fighting with for years. But I'll tell you one thing, when we needed a telephone call in Chemnitz, for the band, the German band that played there, there was a network that stretched all the way from the people here to go and organise a, co uh, um, a, um, a concert in there because the leading German band was signed up to those people around that Love Music Network and people remember that they did, they did, a, they did a gig there and lots and lots of people went because there's a network of anti-fascist and anti-racist thing. The final thing I, I want to say is why we need clarity. Uh, we need clarity about understanding who we are. First, we need to know who somebody's a Nazi, somebody's a racist populist, and then you need a strategy mm. in being able to do that. But we also need a strategy that unites people. I'm proud to say that on that demonstration in Wood Green, I marched with Jeremy Corbyn. It's not true. I remember that Jeremy Corbyn was on that demonstration. I'm glad that he was on the demonstration inside Wood Green. There's the enormous growth of, 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 of anti-racists inside this country. But the reason why we need clarity, and the reason one thing that I really uh, I, I want to say about the, the nature of this united front that we need, we need socialists at the heart of it, because as well as fighting against anti-racism, I'll tell you why I used to love the 1970s as well, because I hardly used to go to school sometimes, because the teachers were always out on strike. <laughs> <laughs> they gave us the day off, I used to love it. <laughs> In terms of that, it was a sense. And when you used to say to them, why were, you, why were you out on strike? And they'd give you literary reasons why the government were set of birth, whatever it is, and stuff like that. And actually, the two things flowed into each other. You had a sense in which they were fighting racism, but also they were fighting for your conditions as well, for how you were going to have your education. I actually think we need that. We need one, that we need the anti-racist fight, we need the other, the, the second bit there, but there was also, we also need the question of socialist leadership. In there. I'm not arguing just to teach, by the way. I'm just arguing about working, sorry. I'm talking about working class, I, you had a sense the working class people felt the world belonged to them and not just the people at the top. And that's why I'm really looking forward to kicking Boris Johnson's ass as hard as we can. Because that confidence that they've got, that arrogance they've got, we have to do something about it. I've got to shut up there because I know people want to go. But that, that, and I'll stand up. That's why I'm a socialist and that's why I'd like people to join the socialist. <laughs>